do we have a nomination to the chair? Thank you, Jay. Thank you. All those in favour, please show. I won't hold it against you. Thank you very much. OK, um, obviously, welcome to this um, meeting of the uh, Joint um, Local Plan Working Group, um, the Jack. Um, the first item of business is obviously very sad news about the um, very unexpected death of Councillor Bill Evans at South Ribble. Um, and Councillor Fanner has obviously uh, replaced Councillor Evans. I think it would be appropriate to do a quick minute silence, if that's OK for everybody. Obviously, many of us knew Bill for a long, long time. I've worked with him very closely for many years, and it has been terrible, very much a shock. And I don't doubt members in South Ribble have had to do some of this already. But if you'll indulge us, I think we stand for a quick moment of silence and just remember Bill in our own ways, if that's everybody OK with that. OK, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you for that. Um, obviously, very uh, sad news. Um, as a result, um, and I'm conscious there are some people here who, who are, and there's people dialing in online as well, so welcome to those people online. Um, I think it'd be appropriate, we've got some guests here as well, if we could um, just go around the room and introduce ourselves. Um, I'll start off. I'm Alistair Bradley, I'm the leader of Chorley Council. Go on, Matthew, just introduce yourself. I'm Matthew Pavlish, and I'm the Democratic Member Services Officer. we we'll start on the inside circle first, if that's OK. Um, Chris Haywood, Director of Development and Housing at Preston. David Borrow, Cabinet Member for Planning and Development at Preston. Robert. Alistair Morwood, uh, Executive Member for Planning and Development at Chorley. Uh, Harold Heaton, uh, Planning Chorley. Jonathan Noe, Director of Planning and Development for both Chorley and South Ribble. Councillor James Flannery, Portfolio Lead at South Ribble. Um, thank you. Councillor Gareth Watson, South Ribble. Uh, Councillor Phil Smith, South Ribble. Councillor Julia Berry, Observing from Chorley Council. Thanks. Carolyn Williams, Central Lancs Local Plan Team. Andy Mullaney, Head of Planning and Environment at Lancashire County Council. Uh, Chris Wilson from uh, Consultancy B Group. Uh, we'll be doing one of the presentations today on employment land matters. OK, thank you. And then online, if you just introduce yourself, Chris, if you start with you, Chris, if that's OK. Chris Blackman. One of you go first, Chris or Sue, whichever is easier. Sorry, don't mind. I've heard Chris, so uh, are you meaning me? Go on, Susan. Sorry, go on. All right, sorry. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, sorry, I'm County Councillor Sue Whitten from uh, Lancashire County Council representing Rural North. Thank you. OK. Uh, Chris, you can you go now or...? Yeah, Chair, can you hear me? Yep. Got your note. Sorry, I, I did. I don't know what happened then. I, I was unmuted. Uh, sorry, Chris Blackburn, planning policy team leader, Preston City Council. Somebody has to do it at some point in the meeting, so Chris is <laughs> your, your first. Well done. Um, Edward. Edward Broadhead, um, local plan policy team. And Michelle. Michelle, You're very quiet there, Michelle. You might have to go again and shout up a bit. Oh, we're going to try and turn you up. Go on, try again. Got you that time. Thank you. 
Okay. Welcome, welcome to you all. It comes through differently for different people. So Matthew's frantically turning people up and down, as the case well, may be. Once I can hear you, Chair, it's a bit difficult for uh, over there. And if we've got we'll have just... a, a wheel on your microphone there. So if you press your button off to speak, so, um, kind of so the Smith, if you, there's a wheel on the right hand side or the left hand side, which will turn the microphones up on your device. We've thought about everything here in Chorley, as we always do. Got one that side, yeah. Right. Maybe uh, there's a few others need to turn it up as well, Chair. I speak quite loudly, but uh, some people don't, of course. So uh, no. All I'm, right. I'm just well, thinking of Carolyn's uh, presentation, who uh, has a, a, a tiny little voice and. Um, <laughs> It's sometimes very difficult to hear, and what she has to say is very important you, to us, of You course. must have a very different Carolyn than we have in Joel. <laughs> that's all I'll say. She obviously saves us little voice for South Ribble. Right, OK. Uh, we will try our best, but, yeah, um, Matthew can control the volume, so we'll try and compensate, particularly for those people dialing in, OK? Right, I have apologies for absence from Councillor Harry Landless at Preston, Councillor Caleb Tomlinson at South Ribble, and... Counts, County Councillor Max, Matthew Maxwell Scott from County Council. Is there any other apologies anybody wants us to provide? Zoe Whiteside from Chorley Council. I did wonder where oh, Zoe, yeah, talking sure. about quiet voices, I did wonder where Zoe was, but uh, I'm sure you'll Sorry, Chair, probably, probably County Councillor Michael Green, who's out of the country at the moment. Thank you. Is he? Yeah. I'm intrigued. Lucky him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. The first item of business, thank you all very much, is the minutes of the meeting from the 31st of January that was held at South Ribble, I think. Um, does anybody want to raise any comments on those yeah. minutes? Yeah, 155 said the next meeting of the Central Lancashire uh, Strategic Joint Advisory Committee will be at South Ribble, but we seem to be at Charlie. Hmm, interesting. Any ideas why, Matthew? Uh, I believe that was just a typo in the minutes. That's OK. I just thought I'd point I, it out. I think, to, from, the, from memory, there was a discussion about whether we had it at, at South Ribble because oh. of the COVID spacing we can get at South Ribble. Um, so I take it we are less COVID risky than we were at that point, but who knows? I think it changed on a daily basis, personally. But, yeah, OK. But I'll accept it's a typo as well. I can't honestly remember. I think it was the end of a long meeting, so... But um, I think everybody's here, so we're fine to carry on, if that's OK, Councillor Heaton. Any other um, items arising? In which case, can somebody propose those minutes, please, who was there? Councillor Moore, well, thank you. Anybody seconded those? Yeah, we've got that. Councillor Burrows and Councillor Heaton. All those in favour of accepting those minutes, please show. Yeah, who could rank for four? Yeah, right, excellent. Right. Are there any declarations of interest anybody wishes to make on any of the items under discussion tonight? No. OK, that's good. Um, just before I move on, um, item seven, the education planning um, item, we've been contacted by the ben, Terry. ben Terry. I always get confused with Ben Terry. Two first names, Terry Ben, Ben Terry. Um, from County Council, he can't make it tonight, unfortunately, so he will be going to the individual council working groups. He's already spoken at Charlie's local working group prior to this. But I think he's going to make arrangements to go to South Ribble and Preston's individually and update you with what he told us in Chorley. Um, the idea was we all heard it together, but I'm sure we can all hear it separately and, and, and deal with that if that's OK with everybody. So apologies for that. That was a late withdrawal this afternoon. So our next, oh, our first item ahead of that is the Central Lancashire Employment Study, which is Chris to do a presentation, which has appeared by magic in front of me behind me. Chris, the floor is yours. Speak loudly for Councillor Smith, if you would, and uh, leave me in no doubt of what you're saying, and uh, we'll ask questions at the end of that presentation, if that's OK. All right. Yep, I'll, I'll do my best to be uh, as loud as I can. Um, OK, well, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so as I said in the introduction, my name's uh, Chris Wilson uh, from a consultancy firm called B Group. And uh, we've been working with the, the three councils on the sort of central Lancashire study and um, on the, the specifically the employment land evidence for the local plan um, for some some years now. But um, in the second half of uh, 2021 and just finishing not long into into the new year here in 2022, we did a quite significant update. A study on the sort of need for employment land across the three local authority areas. So, 
was pointing the right way. There we go. Um, so I've just been asked here just to talk about the work which we finished um, so roughly a month ago, uh, just some of the background to what we've done, uh, some of the findings of our study and at a fairly high level, some of the, the recommendations that we've sort of made and how, how they all sort of impact on the, the sort of joint local plan work. Okay, so just a quick bit of background then. Um, you might, some of you might already be familiar with this, but um, we initially completed an land study for Central Lancashire back in 2017. That was quite a substantial uh, piece of work. That was off the back of some uh, South Ribble specific uh, studies we did a couple of years before that. Um, so that was quite a comprehensive uh, study, but obviously that's five years ago now and a lot's happened since then, and particularly obviously a lot's happened in the last two years uh, that's changed. So um, sort of roughly summer 2021, we were approached to do um, a sort of partial update, We're specifically accounting for um, some of the um, government guidance that's come in since 2017, looking at how the economy of Central Lancashire has changed, providing a sort of updated um, property market assessment, and looking again at what's called the, the functional economic market area. So that's the sort of core area economy in which um, Central Lancashire sits. It's immediate sort of commuting belt sort of trading belt, and we were also asked to review the employment land supply uh, within the three local authorities to see, again, to see what's changed in the last sort of five years, and finally provide um, updated uh, um, forecasting for what your needs will be for, for the, the next sort of local plan period. So I'm going to go through those points sort of one at a time at a fairly high level. I'm not, I'm not going to go into vast detail on everything. But um, just in terms of the, the sort of the economy of Central Lancashire, just a few points that are worth sort of highlighting. Um, one is the sort of relative strength and growth of the, the manufacturing sector here in, in Central Lancashire. Um, as, as of uh, roughly the end of 2019, you had some 14,000 people employed across the three local authorities in manufacturing. But crucially, that has actually grown quite significantly since about 2015, about 19% growth, that which equates to about, again, about 2,250 jobs in manufacturing. So obviously that is a quite significant level of growth. It's also um, contrary to a lot of forecasting that's gone on, um, not just now, but, but in, in, in years past, which has generally said that manufacturing, both here and, and, and nationally, will, will decline. So that's just an important thing to, to bear in mind that you know, that sector is, is growing in sort of contradicting to, to some of the past forecasting work. And I'll, I'll come back to that point. Um, less um, sort of controversially, the Construction sector has also grown, although that, that was sort of anticipated by forecasting. Um, quite substantial growth again, about another, a similar number, 2,250 2, new jobs since 2015. But also, whereas manufacturing was mostly growth in existing businesses, um, this has also, construction has also seen new businesses either start up or, or come in, into the borough, into the three boroughs, sorry. And um, that equates to about 300, 335 additional companies, like I say, either starting up or coming into the borough since, since 2015. So it's, it's pretty big growth. Obviously, South Ribble has historically been the sort of centre for the, some of the big construction um, businesses, but most of them more recent growth has been in smaller, uh, you know, uh, small, smaller companies, uh, micro firms, less than, less than 10 employees. And most of that has actually been in Chorley and Preston rather than South Ribble. Now, the office sector, as you might expect, is, is pretty substantial. Um, there's about 40,000 employed overall. Roughly half of that is in Preston. 
which obviously is a, a sort of sub-regional centre for um, sort of finance and administration. And there's been reasonable growth, again, looking since 2015, in most of the employment sectors, equatable to, to about a 20, 30% sort of gain in jobs and businesses. So that growth has been pretty good. Now, we'll caveat that, that the figures really end in, the data, available data pretty much ends in 2020. So obviously we haven't got that COVID impact in there yet. Uh, the data just isn't, isn't out for that yet. But, uh, you know, it's worth highlighting again that that growth has happened pretty consistently right up to, to sort of the start of the COVID period. So it is there, it is substantial. Um, transportation, again, is a growing sector, although this is a completely national phenomenon. Um, so this means sort of logistics, warehousing, and that's um, sort of increased by about a third since 2015. So that's about, again, about 2,500 jobs. Now, COVID sort of impacts, I'm going to, going to dip in and out because of the, there's various ways that, and that sort of, sort of impacts on, on the economy. So, I mean, it's worth knowing that, you know, Central Line was, was a, in terms of the sort of basic impacts like furloughing um, of staff, Central Lancashire's impact was fairly standard in terms of numbers, furloughed, changes in, in unemployment, that kind of thing. So you weren't exceptionally badly hit and you weren't exceptionally gently hit. Um, but like I said, I'll come into that more onto the property angle rather than the um, sort of uh, uh, the, the sort of worker force impact. Oh, wrong way around. There we go. Okay, so... A sort of key element of what we do is uh, analysis of the local property market. That's the demand, obviously, for industrial and office space. So we look at a variety of, of statistics on, um, on past transactions, on the available market supply. But crucially, we also, you know, got on the phones and talked to the agents, the developers, the people who are at the coalface to get the views. So, I mean, just on the whole... You know, the view is that the, the industrial market has held up very well over, over the COVID period, over 2020, 2021. Um, not just logistics, which has grown across the board, because, of course, there's so much more e-commerce happening today as opposed to a couple of years ago, but also in the production, in the manufacturing. Obviously, we've talked previously about the jobs, but, uh, you know, just generally the demand for industrial warehouse space has been held up really well, you know, the market is for anything up to about 5,000 square metres, so, so so about 50,000 square feet, if you prefer. Um, so any size pretty much up to there is, is, is wanted at the moment. But of course, as it tends to happen, the strongest demand is for the smallest accommodation, so that's um, you know, sort of naught to 500 square metres space. And again, let's say average rents are sort of £69 a square foot at the moment. Now, the office market... As you might expect, in terms of the mar uh, actual market demand, you know, the, there was a cliff in 2020 and, and sort of the first half of 2021, uh, as no one knew what, what was happening in terms of, of office working. Um, there has been some recovery from, from that, that low point, um, but it tends, it's really focused at the smaller end of the market. So businesses are really looking for small, flexible frequently serviced and not automatically serviced suites um, that, you know, can accommodate people who are coming back from home working, maybe on a part-time basis, just want a small space. Companies that are maybe have more of the staff at home, so are looking to uh, downsize somewhat and, you know, have the flexibility to be to work from home or from, from the office. So that's really benefiting that sort of bottom end of the market in, in size terms. And I say rents can, can very particularly obviously depend on, on what, whether we're talking about serviced or unserviced space. Um, but the, the range is sort of eight to 16 pounds a square foot. Obviously the market for larger offices really is still recovering, you know, except obviously for, for odd requirements for, for public sector agencies and what there just isn't the market for, for big offices at the moment. But obviously that uh, could be subject to some change Okay, so as I sort of said at the start, one of the things we look at is what's called the functional economic market area or the, the FEMA. So again, this is the area you, um, around central Lancashire that um, where most commuting happens. 
This is where um, most jump back one. Um, the, the, where most commuting happens and um, where um, you know a lot of the sort of high, low levels of economic trade occurs. So it's obviously not normally a complicated thing. You know, you're, you're, the FEMA is most of your neighbouring authorities here in Lancashire and of course extending into um, Greater Manchester. And you know, in the study itself, we've got. Um, quite a big discussion about what's happening in those different authorities. But just to highlight a few, again, a couple of fairly key points. As we said, the market for logistics space is really strong nationally. You know, it is, it's, you can find it's pretty much anywhere. And obviously, the market's responding to that. So you are getting a lot of growth of competing logistics locations. So Bolton, um, obviously, you have the, Kurt, the Kurt Acre or the Logistics North site, which has been running for many years now. That's pretty much full, but it's worth noting there is a, a, effectively a, a second site in Bolton, which is um, 33 hectares. It's west of Wingate's industrial estate, and that's just north of West Horton. So again, that is a site which is in their local plan, or about to be to be allocated in the local plan. Um, and again, you know, that that is potentially the, the the logistics north to for Bolton. So just worth noting that. Um, at Wigan, uh, Junction 25, on the M6, there's a scheme for about 140,000 square metre scheme. And then at Blackburn, on the M65, there's now this is the market for replacement for the original, the Frontier Park site, um, where again, um, that looks like that's going to be at uh, Junction 5 on the M65, so a little, a little bit closer towards central Lancashire. Uh, and then, of course, Skelmersdale, there's, there's long established um, industrial spaces there. Of course, uh, you have the, the different competing enterprise zones. Now, I will be coming, obviously coming back to, to Salisbury and what's happening there in a minute. But obviously, Salisbury is normally part, partnered with Wharton, although obviously the vast majority of the development activity, at least for employment, is happening at Salisbury at the moment and looks like it's going to continue to happen at Salisbury given recent announcements. Um, obviously, you do have the two other enterprise zones, which are Blackpool Airport and Hill House. Obviously, Hill House is, is sort of chemicals. It's um, it's not really relevant. Blackpool Airport has some overlap, um, but it is more on sort of civilian aviation sort of things. So, so again, there's... there's there's sort of a distinction between that and, and what's happening at Salisbury, which obviously has slightly more of a, of a sort of military focus. So, I mean, that's mostly background, and obviously I can give, follow up on any of those points if you, if you want at the end. But obviously our, our core analysis, what we do, is look comparing your current employment land supply with your forecast needs to say, you know, what, what you need to actually need to be allocating in the local plans um, required. So obviously we, we took an updated look at all the, the relevant sites for each one um, and particularly what's changed since 2017. So, I mean, just starting in Chorley, obviously things are progressing slowly at uh, the Botany Bay site, the great, what's the great Noli, Noel site. Um, you know, we are seeing improved delivery prospects there after a few sort of false starts that seem to be happening there. Obviously, the one thing that has come forward since 2017 is the Strawberry Fields site on Exton Lane. Um, so obviously, you have the digital hub, which is built and, and up and running. And now you have some of the, the other units, which will sit alongside that, uh, I think, are going up as we speak. Um, at Buckshaw Village, at the Southern Commercial site, and that's the one that straight in front of the, the railway station. Obviously, the Orbit Developments now built a large office on that frontage. We have spoken to Orbit. Um, they've done it as a sort of initial investment. They're not hugely confident about, about the sort of success of that particular proposal because um, it was quite costly and it went up, obviously, just as COVID was hitting, unfortunately, for them. Um, so, you know, it looks like it, instead of, it's unlikely to probably go for one big occupier. It's like it'll be sort of sold off or let off in, in chunks 
again, reflecting the market for sort of smaller space at the moment, but that's, that's their view anyway. So, and obviously unless something dramatic happens there, there's probably not going to be many more offices built on that site, um, at least for the short term. So that's just, that's just side. Preston, obviously there's a wide variety of things happening in Northeast Preston. I won't, I won't go into them all. Um, obviously well, there has been quite a bit of development in, in the various different sites up there. Uh, and on the land at Eastway, which is it was on development last year, probably finished by now. Um, but probably the big thing that's that's in the pipeline is the um, I think it's called the Longridge Road Energy Centre. That's a sort of energy from from waste sort of facility, which is on the south of the the Red Scar Industrial Estate up there. So that's probably the key thing that's in the market. Uh, we, when I say there's a comment there, so the ELR sites. Uh, one of the things Preston has to look at is a variety of, sort of small urban infill sites. Um, those total about 11 hectares, and most of them are just very, very small little plots here and there, probably not, not worth getting into. Obviously, um, the one that is of more significance is the Fullwood Barracks. So obviously there's questions about the sort of future of that, what's going to happen with that. Obviously we've heard a few, few different things, but um, obviously the initial view was that this was going to close probably towards the middle of this decade. And then that would open up, you know, potentially a fairly sizable, you know, high quality redevelopment opportunity in that sort of uh, North Preston area. Um, then at South Ribble, obviously the big thing that's really happened there is at the Farrington Hall estate site. Um, there's proposals, and they may have actually started by now, uh, for a big 50,000 square metres logistics unit, which was certainly the biggest project, I think, to, in the start in the, to at least start in the northwest in 2021. Um, often be a very major property for logistics purposes. Um, there's also been a bit more progress at the Moss Side Test Track site, which is um, now sort of marketed as, as Titan Business Park. It's obviously had a few names over the years. Um, but, you know, there's just going to be a firmer plan for taking that forward and delivering about... Uh, 4.7 hectares of sort of in land for industrial purposes. So that's the local supply. So as, as sort of figures say, deducting recent developments, sites that, that don't seem to be deliverable, things like that. Um, we sort of have, says that your current supply across central Lancashire is about 191 hectares with about 56 hectares in Chorley, about 82 and a half in Preston, and about 52 in South Ribble. So that's the local supply. Obviously, you do have on top of that the strategic sites, which are Cureden and the Salisbury Enterprise Zone sites. Now, Cureden, um, obviously, previous plans with which the county council is working together have pretty much been discarded on that. And at the time of us doing this study, there was a, a working on, on a new master plan with the preferred developer, Maple Grove, but that was confidential at the time. And so obviously we couldn't really talk any more about that. Uh, obviously, Salisbury, um, as you know, quite a bit's actually happened in, in Salisbury over recent years. So there's been a, been a range of developments, um, including the Advanced Manufacturing Resource Centre, which was under development when we were doing this study. I think it's probably finished now. And of course, the big announcement, which happened just as we were sort of coming towards the later stage of the study, which was the uh, National Cyber Force Initiative, which is a sort of $5 billion investment on that site for, for the major new uh, cyber campus, uh, due for completion by about 2030, although that's sort of as far as the announcements got while we were actually doing this study. So... Uh, that's one for the future. Okay, so like I said, that was a sort of supply consideration. Um, the key then, obviously, is forecasting what needs go alongside that. Now, there's fairly standard methodologies you use for those. Now, I won't go into stupid detail about, about both of them, but basically the, the two methods you use are taking historic trends, that's past take-up rates, and projecting those forward, and looking at labour demand. That's basically taking jobs forecasts and um, using their projections of jobs growth and then converting those jobs growth into first into floor space and then into a land need. 
So, I mean, just a few basics about what we did in that regard. Obviously, the forecast people period we were asked to look at was 17 years, so that's 2021 to 2038. Um, in terms of the historic trends, we use data on completions, that's development in, in each local authority area, which goes back to 1991. And then the, the jobs, we got forecasting on Cam Cambridge Econometrics, which came uh, through uh, Lancashire County Council. And that's up updated to summer 2021. So that will include the latest forecast they have, which obviously reflected the COVID position as of that point, the projected impacts of that on, on employment, what was understood about Brexit, again, as of, as of summer 2021, and um, those sort of factors. So like I said, I'm not going to go through the whole methodology, just go straight to sort of the outputs from those models. So projecting forward the historic trends and then taking away the supply, which, which I mentioned previously, uh, the estimate is that Chorley needs about another 20 hectares of land on top of what it's already got. Preston has just about enough land to meet its needs, although it depends whether you count those small um, urban infill sites I mentioned before, the ELR sites. If you count them, then its, it's surplus is, is reasonable. It's about 11 and a half hectares. Obviously, if you take them, then it's take them away, then it's just about at equilibrium, I say plus 0.25 surplus. And South Ribble uh, needs about uh, 26 hectares. Now, the labour demand, the jobs forecasts, um, um, like I said, this is taking forward jobs growth. The forecasts, again, I'm not, I'm not going to get bogged down with, with, with all the jobs forecasts, but basically they forecast fairly healthy growth in construction and in um, most office sectors, equal to about another 1,200 jobs per sector across central Lancashire up to the period uh, 2038. Uh, but that's offset by the traditional forecast of a drop in manufacturing employment. Um, that drops, equates to about 1,200 jobs less in manufacturing by 2038. And because manufacturing takes up more space per job than offices does, even though the jobs growth is positive, the, 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 the actual land need moves into a negative when, when you put it towards both, which is why you get some, some very strange, huge surpluses when you which do the calculation, like I say, 48 to 58 hectares of surplus in Chorley, up to 78 in Preston, and up to 47 in South Ribble. Now, as you might expect, we do favour the historic trends model over the um, the jobs model, and there's some very good reasons for that. Um, obviously, one logical reason is how much jobs densities are changing as we're going forward. So obviously, COVID is the obvious example with that. More and more people are working from home, or at least part time. You can get far more jobs into an office space than you could previously. So um, you know, you can you can greatly increase the numbers of in-office employment and it'll make very little difference to the actual number of floor space you need. Um, as I've touched on in the past, the forecasts consistently say manufacturing jobs are in decline. Well, all the evidence we've seen to date says, you know, actually you're, they're growing at, at a pretty high clip. So again, it's not, it's not reflecting what you're seeing in the real world. Um, and also the simple truth that, that businesses grow and contract for reasons other than just how many people are employed. Um, you know, um, I want to give one example. People talk about um, increases in automation in manufacturing. Well, that's fine, but machines still take up space. So even if, if, a, if a, a work, big automated warehouse or big automated factory has hardly any employees, it's still as big as it ever was. So again, there's a further unclipping between jobs and um, and um, the amount of employment land. And then um, just the, the simple fact that the real world take up has far exceeded, you know, what's been forecast. So that is why, you know, at the end of the day, we say, look, you need, you need to, to look at what's happening in the real world, which is looking at the, what you've achieved historically and sort of projecting that forward. So again, like I say, the total needs for central Lancashire 
on that basis are about 225 hectares. Obviously, we take off the existing supply, which means that the sort of net residual is about 70, sorry, 46 hectares. Again, with the bulk of need falling into Chorley and, and South Ribble specifically. Now, we weren't really asked to, to go into any great detail about um, the sort of where you might find that other land. We just obviously gave a few points based on what the market was telling us about, you know, where the market would favour the, the land going. Obviously in Chorley, you know, sites on the M61 corridor would obviously be good for, for logistics, for larger manufacturing. Um, Bookshaw Village remains a popular centre again for um, for smaller industrial, for smaller warehousing. You know, There's a pretty strong cluster of, of fairly high quality manufacturing there. So, you know, that is favoured and I appreciate obviously the land may not be there given given what's available, but that's where the market says it should be. Uh, Preston, obviously, again, still have this question of Fulwood Barracks, which I think, uh, depending on what it was used for, can give you a maximum of about nine hectares if it was all used for employment. I'm not saying it, it would be. Uh, but ultimately, you know, North East Preston and city centre is, is, is what sort of where it's at for, for most things. And South Ribble, obviously, you have the question about, which, like I said, the Cure and Strategic Site you know, has been said to be primarily a strategic site, but to what degree could it also meet local needs is, is, is obviously a fair question. And then, of course, larger stuff, you'd want to look for the, the motorways. Okay, that's pretty much it uh, for what I was going to present. So I don't know if we want to open to questions or... Thank you, you for do that. It. Um, that's very clear, thank you. Um, open for questions... If anybody's got any, or are you all mulling over your own local areas and uh, mm. comments around Fulwood Barracks and Norley? Yes, Jay, Councillor Flannery. Thanks, Jay. Uh, thanks for that, Chris. Um, just looking at um, some of the information presented, so thanks for the, uh, what you've mm -hmm. given us. I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. the construction se sector is, is a mobile sector. 95% of the businesses are SMEs. Most of them, the commercial sector right now, are struggling. I know, I know there's an issue about domestic, that no one can get someone to do some work in your house, but the commercial businesses are struggling. They're laden with a bit more debt. With respect, we're all sitting here, but the public sector haven't recognised a lot of the issues around cash flow. I know companies who are speaking to us about extensions of time not getting recognised in terms of the fixed JCT contracts, etc., etc. So there's a, there's a bit of work which needs to be done then. I'm just wondering, it's quite a big sector and it featured quite a lot in your presentation, mm -hmm. but you know, your methodology, are you pretty confident about the information you've got or is, is it quite fluid still for construction? Uh, no, no, I think we're pretty pretty confident. Like I say, we're, um, you know, we're to, like I say, there wasn't much business consultation in this work. We were, we're talking to the, to the property side mm -hmm. as to where the demand is. And, you know, you know saying that that sector has grown Pretty consistently, um, you know, and there's no evidence that it, it's it's slowing down in that regard. I mean, we are talking, uh, you know, small to mid-sized businesses here. You know, and, and I know there's some some absolutely giant developers in, in South Ribble. Uh, we're not talking that that sort of scale coming in. You know, it is just in some cases it's just a local handyman uh, stroke. You know, small companies up to about maybe about ten employees sort of thing. But yeah, you know what people are telling us from the property side of things is is the demand's pretty healthy for for, for those sort of small units for those yards. You know, it, it's a good sector to have because they'll go almost anywhere. You know, that they'll take up some of the some of the older industrial properties. I think we're saying about you know sort of constrained finance in some cases. Well, if you've got an older industrial estate, the stuff that just isn't isn't suitable for the latest high tech manufacturing, but you know, you can get a, get a builders in there pretty pretty safely, sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, I think the, the market's pretty strong. Okay, any other questions or comments? Yes. Councillor Gareth Watson. Um, with manufacturing, obviously you've uh, mentioned that it's, it's growing fairly, fairly well. Um, and it's looking to continue to. Is part of that, is that more kind of advanced manufacturing? Are we looking at similar to uh, Salisbury, there's no one earlier, or are we looking at potentially even uh, the effects of, well, the Ukrainian situation and 
the potential for removing um, our dependence on China, Russia type areas, that kind of manufacturing, is that what's factored into it? Um, well, obviously, obviously um, Ukraine's a pretty recent uh, fact, so I don't think we can we can talk too much about that yet. But um, it's you know it is the, the sort of components manufacturer. I mean, advanced manufacturing is kind of a loaded sort of because what you do consider advanced, but uh, but you know um, it is that sort of healthy com components industry. Uh, you know, we do, we do, we do here in Central Lancashire have, um, um, you know, fairly healthy components manufacturing for auto, for for um, the aircraft, you know, for, for trucks and, and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's it's this, it's this, that sort of I don't know what we call it tier, tier three, tier four uh, sort of parts manufacturing sort of thing, which which is can can be done all over the place really. Uh, and it's coming in, so, so yes, it, it's it's the it's a sort sort of widgets level for the manufacturing. So it's it's likely to be a kind of national thing again, similar to the logistics. Is it sort of yeah, like, yeah, yeah. It's it, we, we do these studies all over England and Wales, and and you know we, you get the same all over. Yeah, you know, the logistics and the sort of parts manufacturing is just going through the roof. I mean, we we've, we've just completed a study in, in Warrington where we're based. You know, where, where the demands even higher than it is here and, and you know it's it's just a they really can't build the stuff fast enough to, to meet the needs mm -hmm. um Borough. thank you i'm just looking at the timing of when of the study itself because i think am i right in assuming that you've not taken into account the potential of the big development at salisbury the recent government announcement because that's a significant amount of money coming into the economy and also I think over the winter we've had the proposal for the development of a residential and business village from this on the land between Salmsbury and the Tickle Trout mm -hmm. and again that's very recent so I'm assuming neither of those proposals which both of which would have major effect on employment are actually included in the study that you've done so far. Uh, no, I mean, as, as I think I mentioned, the um, the cyber hub um, announcement literally came in. I think it was October, wasn't it, when that was first announced? Literally, when we sort of towards the end of our study. Um, ultimately, to sort of register that, what we'll need to know is the sort of the real jobs output from that. Obviously, just uh, you know, as it as it stands, the the initiative is still pretty vague. Um, I think moving forward, and obviously I'll look to, to Caroline to confirm the details on this, uh, that I think there'll be further work that will be ongoing um, so this year and next. I think, uh, am I right, that uh, obviously we will then be able to be in more position to take that into account and then if you're right to... Yeah, we have been in discussions with BE Group when we... This was basically like a light touch um, update um, on the objectively assessed need as, as we've gone through tonight. So this, the purpose of this one was to understand realistically if our need had changed drastically as a result of COVID. Um, so when we were looking to identify land to meet our employment needs, we wanted to make sure that we weren't identifying the wrong type of land or too much land that was, just was not going to be needed. To the same extent, um, we did ask at the same time, you know, what kind of much deeper sort of dive update do we need? But at that time was a concern that we didn't have the data because we were only just coming out post-COVID. So we needed to understand um, a bit more about what the impacts of COVID was having. So we asked for a further piece of work that could be undertaken towards the end of this year when we were hoping there'd be further detail out. So um, Chris and his, his team are geared up to do a, a further update, which will form um, part of the evidence base for when we get to the publication next year. Sorry, Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to add, add in, so obviously the research Chris and his team have been doing is almost like a policy off kind of situation. So it's it's looking at what what we know now, and obviously we've had the cyber hub recently announced, and, and yes, it probably will, will have impact, but it's quite quite early. Um, after the Garden Village, it's it's got to go through its own process. It, whether it gets planning permission, we don't know at this stage, or, or indeed does it get allocated local plan, we don't know at this 
this stage or, or not um, on that. So it's, it's quite difficult to predict it in, in the study at the, at the moment. Chair, I was just, I was just, just conscious that both those developments are things that could significantly influence the employment issues around the local plan. And the, the timing of them, doesn't, we just probably need to just work to the last possible day to get it, as up-to-date figures as we can when we have to actually run with the local plan. But I think, yeah. uh, sadly, neither of them are in Preston, but I can see both of them having a significant impact on Preston and the city centre in Preston. Uh, agreed. And potentially take up some of that office space as well because those kind of jobs will probably be more office based but there will be a supply chain going into that which will probably go wider won't it so I think yeah we need to keep getting constant updates as part of this process I think that's um, I like the way you referred to the uh, the Cambridge study as uh, not right um, and basically yeah. predictions are never right are they predictions are predictions mm -hmm. and you have to keep updating with the information you get so um, yeah, I mean that's uh, that's. I just want to say that that's no reflection against the actual data. That's that's an experience we have with forecasting across the country. You know, the, these are national, uh, nationally derived uh, forecasts, which are then disaggregated down to the local level, and then they just can't pick up the sort of local peculiarities uh, in the way that they sort of need to really. Okay, any more questions at all on that report? If not, thank you, Chris, for that report. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about this in the future um, yeah. because, like we said, we need these updates and we need to take it right, like Councillor Borough says, right to the, to the end of the game So, um, and, and keep getting those updates. So thank you very much for your time. You're, happy, you're welcome to stop on it. You can uh, disappear off now. It's up to yourself. Yeah, I think I'll. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, members, we are uh, asked to note that report. So that's noted. I take it we move on to the next item, which is... Andrew and the Lancashire Economic and Environmental Studies update. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, ah, for those paying attention earlier, Councillor Heaton, um, he's not here. So Terry Ben or Ben Terry is not here, and we will come. It will come back to us. We already had. It's all right. <laughs> we'll be a test later, Harold. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the, the item is entitled uh, Economic and Environmental Studies, but I understand the economic part will be coming to the next meeting. So this is just um, a summary of the four environmental studies which uh, have been commissioned by Blackpool Council, Blackburn with Darwin Council, Lancashire County Council and the LEP. Uh, and what I want to do is just take you through um, for the next 10 minutes, then I'll take some questions after, just some of the headline findings from those four environment reports. Um, so they, they have their origins in um, certainly the County Council making resolutions about uh, transitioning to net carbon zero, but I think we all recognise across the board councils were making climate declarations, climate emergencies to be net zero. And across Lancashire, I think most of those declarations have been made now. And they are for a variety of timescales, some 2030, some 2040, some 2050. And some of them are for just the council itself or for the wider geographic economy. So the first thing really was to look at, well, do we really know uh, what the pathway is? Have we got a credible pathway? If we've declared an emergency to be net zero by 2030 or 2040, can we actually get there? So that was one of the first questions we, we sought to answer. Um, so the four studies commissioned, the first one is, was that pathways to net zero, um, but another three related to that, which are just as important, one around climate resilience, so the other side to climate change, and how can Lancashire cope with the, the forecast climate impacts. The third one was, was a state of the environment report, and uniquely on this one, Lancashire does have the benefit of a, um, a pioneering report back in 1991. Uh, and some of my younger colleagues uh, have the temerity to ask, ask me, did we have a digital copy of it? Um, I said, no, we don't. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, just basically a look over our shoulder in 30 years, you know, we do have that benefit. Has Have things changed and how have they improved and what are the new issues? Then the fourth study is again a bit of a look over a shoulder, but um, only to 10 years. So in 2011... Uh, a renewables energy study was done uh, and making some forecasts about how renewables could be deployed so so how successful or not have we been in that that's the fourth study 
So the first study, uh, net zeros, um, eight and a half million tonnes of carbon emitted in Lancashire a, a year, so that's quite a lot. And those emissions are equally spread among transport, domestic, industry and commercial sectors. So there's no one sector that greatly stands out. And the study looked at three pathways, basically. 100% net zero by 2030, an extremely ambitious um, scenario. And that's actually 93 months away. So Lancashire having net zero carbon emissions in 93 months. So that, that gives you the scale of the ambition for that. And then the other two, 68 and 78%, those are more in line with the national targets to be net zero by 2050. The UK does have a target to be net zero by 2050. And by net zero, what we mean is um, uh, there's no carbon. Uh, carbon will still be emitted, but um, that those residual emissions will be mopped up by sequestration through tree planting or, or peatland restoration, those kind of things. So three pathways we looked at. Um, I think this is a really good graph, really, because it just shows uh, in very graphical terms what, what net zero looks like. So the top blue line is basically business as usual. So carbon will carry on, redu our redu emissions will reduce if we do nothing, because it's just the way we're going. Um, the middle two lines, the green and the, the light blue, are pathways towards the 2050 national target. And then the line on the left, which looks like it's falling off a cliff edge, is net zero by 2030. So that, that's basically where our emissions are, uh, and then a steep uh, downward trajectory to be net zero by 2030. So already that shows us what, what a tough ask that is. And not surprisingly, um, the study has concluded net zero by 2030 is extremely unlikely. I think for extremely unlikely, perhaps read the word impossible. And I'll come on to the reasons for that. It's largely to do with transport and industrial sectors. So um, the UK is going to stop selling fossil fuel vehicles by 2030, but there's going to be an, an inelasticity in the sector since then. You know, people are going to carry on using those cars. Um, and also some of the large industrial emitters as well, uh, which we do have a few in Lancashire. Uh, they will reduce along with national targets, but it won't be by 2030. But the study does tell us, with, with very strong action, um, we could achieve 78% reduction by 2035 uh, on a 1990 level, so um, getting in line with th those national targets. And it also tells us that all councils can contribute um, to that, that big reduction. Uh, as well as looking at a county, we also asked for the study to, to look at a snapshot in each district. And this is just one I've selected from Hindburn. Um, so as you can see, that the emissions there and then that very end uh, snapshot by 2035, looking at a pie chart there of what the various sector contributions could be. And in this one, you'll, you'll see there in Hindburn, you know, 42% from commercial and, and transport. Um, and there's also a big domestic sector there of 30 Six percent is it? Can't remember. Uh, so the, what we what we'd looked at in the pathway, um, we extended it to see when net zero could actually be achieved, and we also factored in two scenarios: so a high electrification scenario uh, and a prominent role for get for hydrogen. And there's a lot of debate at the moment of just how how uh, big a role hydrogen will be. If you talk if you talk to Cadent Gas, um, they, they'll probably uh, big up the role for hydrogen because their role is in, in dealing with gas, whether that's methane or hydrogen or whatever else. Um, but let, other people are a bit more sceptical about how much hydrogen could contribute. So we looked at both of those scenarios and both of them conclude that um, by the early 2040s, Lancashire could get uh, to net zero, but it would need maximum uh, intervention and removal measures also in, in those sequestration fields of, of tree planting, peatland restoration, uh, or even grasslands. Um, so just some of those, those interventions will be around major large-scale interventions around the transport sector will be needed, walking, cycling, public transport, demand reduction, EV charging, very large-scale programmes of domestic building intervention, insulation, glazing, so Lancashire does have a high proportion of, of very poor insulated properties, old properties. Uh, large interventions at uh, major industrial installations, so uh, 
installations like Castle Cement, which is one of the biggest emitters in the region and in the UK. And then large-scale carbon removal interventions, uh, so peatland, tree planting, uh, that kind of stuff. So that, that's in a nutshell what the, the, the pathways study tell us, tells us. So study number two is climate resilience, about how do we cope with climate change. I've just got a couple of slides on this. Uh, the chart on the left is an interesting one. So what that shows is for every year since the Industrial Revolution, uh, or before the Industrial Revolution, until now, every year on there has got a band, a colour. And that colour um, is red if, it's, if the temperature is higher than the average temperature before the Industrial Revolution. So in other words, you can see since the Industrial Revolution, as time has gone on, we've got more and more reds. So when of, on average, the years have been hotter uh, every year. Um, and next to that, we've got, we've got some of the important um, climate change events which Lancashire has experienced. So, you know, your Storm Desmonds or, or, or our neighbours have the, the severe Cumbrian floods. Um, so what the study shows us is that Lancashire is already one and a half degrees warmer. Sometimes it might not feel like that, but, but we are on average one and a half degrees warmer than uh, the end of the 19th century. Um, so that's an average you know, that's a consistent average, which is, which is quite, a, quite a bit. Uh, and what it's saying is by the 2080s, our average annual temperature will be four degrees higher. So in 50-odd in 50, 50 years, we're going to be on average four degrees higher. Um, so, that you know, the kind of things which we're seeing on the, on the slide there, which was, uh, for those that might recognise it, was, was uh, just a stone's throw away from here on the moors. Uh, you know, those kind of moorland events and uncontrolled fires will be more frequent. And it also tells us we, we can expect a twofold a doubling in the increase in frequency of uh, very heavy rainfall, leading to, to uh, frequent river flooding uh, or surface water flooding. And these are all pictures taken from Lancashire. You know, these are not, these are not stock images off the internet, internet. These are things which have occurred on our doorstep. Um, so the third report was the State of the Environment report, and you might recall I said this was a, a look over, over our shoulder for the last 30 years. We looked at 24 indicators across eight themes. Um, on the whole, you'd be pleased to know that things have improved. I think, I think we'd be in a bit of a pickle if, if things had got worse over those 30 years, but there are still some significant problems. Air quality continues to be a problem. On the whole, air quality is generally good across the county but we do have 24 areas which have been designated because of poor air quality, usually caused by vehicle emissions, and those are typically around major road junctions. Um, the other thing is waste. Uh, we, have, we have done reasonably well in waste, so for the Lancashire County Council area, 34% of our waste is still landfilled, 46% of waste is recycled, but that figure was plateaued, and it's, it's plateaued for quite a few years now. And on, on nature recovery, um, uh, the, the Environment Act does include some, some major new duties for councils on nature recovery, which we'll, we'll be getting regulations on guidance on very soon. But in Lancashire, we know that uh, there's been a substantial decline in habitats and species, and that's, that, that uh, is reflected in national data as well. And then the fourth report was our renewables deployment report. So back in 2011, where there was a forecast made of... Um, how much renewable energy might be deployed in Lancashire in the next 10 years. Um, and that predicted 807 megawatts uh, would be deployed, and we've actually deployed around 544. Um, so we've, we've underperformed in terms of renewable deployment. And three areas in particular, wind, biomass, and heat, pump, heat pumps are well below forecast. Um, so... Those are the four studies, uh, some emerging themes, and these are very high level, but I think it's helpful just to look at some consistent themes emerging from those. So uh, a major green infrastructure programme, uh, delivery of that is going to help across a lot of those reports. A major green housing infrastructure programme, uh, so looking at building and energy efficiency in, in the domestic sector. 
Local energy planning, I think, is particularly important and I think, you know, linked to the kind of things we're talking about in, in uh, local plans. Um, what are our energy uses? How are those going to be provided for in the future? How might we encourage more de renewables to de be deployed? Then finally, um, uh, transport, so bus improvements, active travel and EV charging, I think, are big areas, again, for us to focus on. So that's it, me. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Andrew. And Harold had his hand up before I even pressed the microphone. Oh, before you even asked. I know you did. Go on, Harold. Um, you said uh, about 2070 will be four degrees higher. Is that with the carbon targets or without? Is that what you, I didn't quite understand that one. Yeah. Um, that That's without any mitigation. So, yeah. So if, if business as usual carries on, yeah. Look on the bright side, please. <laughs> <laughs> David Burroughs. It's just two obvious points that jump out in terms of a planning committee work. We need, clearly, until we get better house building standards laid down by central government, which actually force new house building to be more energy efficient, we're not going to get anywhere. And the second thing is, until there is the sort of scheme in the UK that you see in much of continental Europe in terms of insulation and heat pumps, etc., we've got to have a, load of, a long, long way to make, to make up. Both of those areas are key in terms of the work we do as a planning committee. And not, nothing seems to be happening on either of those at the moment. So, uh, that meets the scale of, of the challenge that we've got. And um, look at Andrew nodding. Um, you agree with that point? Uh, I, I do agree with it, yeah. Although I think it's it's important to remember that um, you know we do have an existing building stock uh, which can also be addressed. So new building standards, yes, important, but they're on, they're on the thin end of the wedge. Um, Councillor Flannery. Thanks, Chair. Um, if ever there's an agenda where we have to work collaboratively, this is it. That's a good point made there as well. But Andrew, I thought your presentation was excellent. Um, so if you don't mind, I, uh, I'm going to get a copy of that to all our council members too. Because the way you presented it and the way you... I'm a visual learner, the way you present it in your graphs and, and the, 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 the points, the way you put them across were brilliant. So well done today. Thank you. Any other questions or points? I've actually heard a lot of that. For a previous one you did to us at the county with lecture leaders, so it, it takes some sinking in. Although I appreciate the use of more flooding in Jolly just to ram the point home, so thank you for that. I'm just missing the water ski, the jet ski going across the, the ponding at Ashley Park. Um, any other questions or comments? Uh, yes, Councillor Phil Smith. Thank you. Uh, just a quick one, really. I think it's more concerned with, with planning and, um, you know, can you believe we're still building new houses to, nowadays without photovoltaic cells on the roof? I mean, how can that happen? Um, we're still building, you know, hundreds of thousands of houses and they've still got nothing on the roofs. It's just quite a, a fairly simple, straightforward one. Um, and, and I take it your point over there about the old housing stock uh, and the thin end of the wedge. Well, the thin end of the wedge is getting thinner if we're not very careful, to be quite honest. So. Agree. Uh, Michael Gover asked me on many things, but he's not mentioned that one, Councillor Smith, but uh, I'm sure he will at some point. And again, it's about us lobbying, isn't it? Going back to Councillor Burroughs's point, we need to lobby to do this because, as we've seen from those graphs there, no matter what the colour of government, we need assistance to get down to those levels because that is a steep decline, whichever way you look at it, to get to those targets. Yeah. Just come back on that, and I think... I mean, you're quite right in national planning policy, but, you know, is it not a local planning policy that we can actually introduce when we're talking about uh, planning policies? Um, it's part of what's in the next part of the, uh, <coughs> the agenda. Um, so in central Lancashire, can we not have a local planning policy? Can we not have an SPD um, somewhere down the line that will help this move forward and perhaps put pressure on developers because that's what it really needs um, to actually put these things in place. Understood. And I'm, Caroline, I'm looking at you. Are you going to come back on that? Because obviously 
that's why I, th I imagine Andrew's here. It is, and I've been, I have been looking at um, work elsewhere and liaising with colleagues I've got working in different authorities and actually had a really good catch-up with a friend at Bradford last week and about how they're using solar panel on their social housing. Um, and I'm saying, you know, for me, that, that's where you need to start. All social housing should be built with solar panels because realistically, if they are at the poorer end of the community and they're only just, you know, giving them free energy effectively when you're living in a house is the way forward, but it's for everything. So we are looking at ways we can do that. We are constricted by what building control or building regs that are coming forward state. There is leeway in there, it does say, for us to go above what those new standards are, but we have to justify it and they've also justify it doesn't affect the viability. And we obviously know that with any development, there's a significant amount of other requirements that are needed to be delivered. And developers are very good at identifying what they can and can't deliver. But we are working with them and one of the processes we're going to be hopefully doing before we get to prepared options is having a session with our house builders to talk through kind of different approaches we want to take in the plan. And this will be one that I would talk to them about how can they be greener. And when they speak to you in a one-to-one, -one, they're very clear they want to be. They just don't want to be if the person next to them isn't being because it makes them uncompetitive. Although I think actually going forward, they're probably uncompetitive if they're not green. So I think that there are ways of doing that. But it's not just house building. It's, it's our um, industrial employment premises as well that also need to be built to those standards as well. So just to be clear, kind of on the back of that, there will be policies that come forward as part of this plan that we will try and enact in central Lancashire, but some of them may be challenged because they are contrary to national policy. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly it. So what I'm trying to do is evidence where it's been delivered elsewhere already and, and it's, it's getting, you know, mm. it, it's, it's working. Um, as an example, as to say, if some, I know you can't always say it's light for light between authorities in different parts of the country, but if we can show it's working elsewhere, but also to show that we, we really do need to do this. Um, so that our idea is to try and get as many, you know, to get this, this plan as green as we can get it, bearing in mind the restrictions that we're on. But we aren't doing this in isolation. So Andy is sitting on a group that I've been attending, which Lancashire Nature Partnership is one of them. And there's also climate change officer group and a climate change planning group. So collectively across Lancashire, we are looking to work together to try and work on policies that we can all sort of deliver. So if we're all working on the same agenda across Lancashire and then leading into the wider region, then hopefully that, that puts the, the, the area as a whole um, in, in a great position moving forward. Yes, Phil, and then Chris. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chair. You, you mentioned uh, justification with regard to the uh, developers. Um, and this must be one of the easiest things to actually justify. Uh, I can't think of a good reason for not doing it. Um, and maybe in planning terms, that might be a, a bit different. But um, rather than being a follower, perhaps we should be a leader and let people follow us, as opposed to us trying to follow other people. Thank you, Chair. Noted. Chris. Yeah, just a reminder to everybody um, that we do have, or we did have, a policy in our core strategy which had those high standards in place. In fact, by now, we should have been reaching code, is it level six of the Code for Sustainable Homes, but the government abolished the Code for Sustainable Homes. So that undermined our local policy, and they basically told us we can't do that anymore. So we've tried it. We tried it once before. That's not to say we, we can't try it again. But we've been undermined by national policy on this. And thank you, Chris. I think that is the point that we've pulled before a little bit as well, is that we may be at odds again. With, but, but to come back to Councillor Smith, and I'm bearing your blue-green tinge there, Councillor Smith, is about that we've got to state what we want to do, whether the government are keeping up with that or not, whether at that point in time. So I think it's important that we're clear about what we'd like to do, even though that may be con you know, conflicted with... The direction of travel in certain other areas because that 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 real, the roll back of some of those core um, um, targets was probably a reaction to other things driving the market a different direction the idea that housing is some kind of economic driver of, of things that's not a, to me and i imagine others in the room from what i'm hearing a reason to relax those standards but it appears to be that some people thought it was in the past we've got to be robust on that and challenge back Social housing was mentioned earlier, but social housing is only going to... Uh, that, that's the client group that would benefit most from energy-efficient homes. 
but the economics around it depend upon government policy, not simply in terms of building control, but in terms of funding yeah. and what and how much they're able to spend on a house. If if the money's not there and they've got to build a hundred rented houses, then they've got to do it on the, the way that manages that enables them to do it. And if that's not to an energy energy efficient standard, that's what the dilemma we would be faced with as a planning authority. Exactly. And agreed. I think everybody's nodding around the room. So just to sum up, because I'm conscious of time and moving on, I think the, there seems to be a consensus around aiming for the highest standards, no matter what the national picture is, um, to, to take that learning, as Carolyn said, from other areas that have tried this as well, and to be pathfinders, if we possibly can be as well, if we need to be, to go out there. But that will need all of us, and we're being lobbied a little bit here by uh, Andrew and others to say, this is what you need to get on your radar, put that stuff into our plan to get to those targets and then remind the government of their obligations through the people that we send to Westminster and elsewhere to, to make those points. It, it will not be a, a simple road because of the reasons we just described, but we shouldn't, that shouldn't stop us being very clear about what Central Lancashire wants to achieve. And I think the fact that there's consensus in the room is, is quite interesting and quite good. So I think we need to keep that moving forward. Although Councillor Heaton won't be here to see the benefits, he can remind us. Sorry. You won't be here to see the benefits, will you, Harold, do you reckon? I don't think so. <laughs> in a better if place. Around, if, if you are around, I'll have a chat about it. Fair enough, right, okay. <laughs> well, agree on that then. Right, okay. I think we've given that a good airing. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, the presentation was excellent. And uh, if you can give the slides, it would be good to get that, that, that message out there, as Councillor Plannery said. And uh, thank you very much for your time. We're asked to note that report again, so that's for noted. Um, by all means, you're welcome to leave the meeting. Um, and on that basis, we'll move to item nine. Um, Caroline, Caroline, do you want to um, take us through this next item? Okay, I'm sorry. It's all right. Copy yeah, that's fine, yeah. Sort out the, the logistics of what we need to do. Thank you. So I'll, I'll try and be as quick as I can. I think hopefully, although South Ribble perhaps members didn't hear this, I've, I've, I've recently done this for press and this morning, and surely I've already had this update. So it's just to give you a position as to where we are on the local plan. Um, so the first update is regarding the delivery, um, and as you were, we've been looking at alternative ways to provide support to, to my team particularly, and it was agreed that the route we would go down is to procure additional support from our existing consultants, and as Chorley are our lead authority for that, it went to Cabinet for them on the 24th of February, and they've agreed to um, go out to that procurement route. So we've got a number of um, decisions already in the system, which will be coming to the chair uh, in, a, in, the, in the next coming week days to, to sign those off and, and more coming forward. So that helped speed development of the local plan along. We've also got additional support now from the three home teams that are providing specific support on areas. So for Chorley, they're providing support on the climate change and natural environment policies. Preston are providing support on design, employment, land, retail, and also supporting around climate change as well. And South Ribble are working with me on sustainable energy and due to cooperate work with Preston as well. So collectively, we're all working together now to get this plan forward as quickly as we can. And the, the aim of that is to get to a preferred options consultation for November this year. However, we're just awaiting some final dates on some pieces of work that need to feed into that. Um, some of it I'll pick up on the agenda as well, so that before we can produce a new local development scheme. On the site assessment work itself, um, we have now completed the initial stage of screening. Um, so this is now um, allowing us to take the work to county to look at transport work and education um, and also our consultants on integrated assessment can start appraising those sites but what we are also doing at this stage is contacting all landowners that did submit sites to the last plan and had them allocated but they haven't come forward in this local plan yet or they haven't contacted us regarding getting those sites allocated and they haven't been delivered in this current plan period so we're trying to engage with them to understand do they still want those sites and if they do great and if or are, any, are there any issues or barriers that are affecting delivery of those or changes of use to potential the allocations so that's a piece of work that's just ongoing on that um, on the local plan policy review ed is going to be doing that shortly so i won't cover that too much it's just to say that we've undertaken a detailed review 
on the core strategy policies and the three local plans in relation to how they perform against national planning policy framework. Um, that work is informing um, how many policies effectively need a complete rewrite or how we need to work collectively to create a new policy for central Lancashire. Because if you recall, we have a core strategy and three local plans. We need to well, combine that into one document. So that's a number of policies across all three that now need to be combined into one. Um, so although the policies in each area may still be relevant, it's how we get that to be a central Lancashire position rather than just a Chorley, Preston or South Ribble position. On our strategic flood risk assessment, the final suite of sites were sent to that recently. So we've been collecting more sites that keep coming into us for assessments and the final tranche of sites has now gone and we are now accepting no more uh, submissions um, until effectively preferred options and that would be people's representations on the local plan. And this is to ensure that we can move forward. If we keep expecting, or sorry, accepting sites until we go out for consultation, we'll never move forward because we've got to go through the full appraisal process. So that level one work is now complete and it's just with home team colleagues and the environment agency to provide their feedback. And then we'll move on to the level two. And the level two work is where we've got specific sites that we think we may want to take forward where there are potential flood risk issues. On our housing evidence, we are moving on swiftly with this and consultants DLP planning um, have produced some draft scenarios which I'll be presenting to um, officers and members in advance of that coming to a jack in, in, in due course. And this evidence will effectively replace what we have in existence and will provide us the understanding of what our need is across the area, um, how that should be met across the three councils, and also looks at specific requirements such as affordable housing, etc. Um, GLP are also being used as one of the consultants to provide specialist support on the development of the preferred options document, and they'll be helping us develop our policies regarding housing as well. Employment land study, um, you've just heard that there, so it's just to update you that we are now proposing to publish that piece of evidence on the website, so that will go on this week, um, so anybody, you know, we'll, we'll circulate a link to that within the minutes for Matthew as well, but just so if you wanted a deeper read of the document that Chris uh, presented to you this evening, you'll be able to get access to that. On our density work, we've agreed a further stage of work with Consultants Hive, and this will be undertaking a session directly with our developers. And this is to engage with them. So if you recall, when we presented that work at a recent JAC, they presented a number of typologies across the area, which looks at urban, suburban, city centre, rural, um, and, and looked at a potential dwelling number in each of those localities. What we want to do now is to engage the developers directly on that to understand whether they are accepting of those potential dwelling levels and if we think they are the correct levels to be delivering going forward and then we'll bring that information back to members for a session with yourselves specifically on that and then that information will effectively be used to understand what densities will be taken forward in the local plan on transport work we are reliant on the county council for this and we have been meeting with them regularly and they have assured us that they are in the process of procuring um, consultants to undertake work on the central lancashire transport master plan um, the intention is for modelling work to start in May there. That is dependent, though, on how quickly they do procure that piece of work. And that work will give us a potential list of infrastructure um, impacts or requirements as a result of where these sites are coming forward. And those issues would think, need to be addressed through the local plan. Um, so through an, an infrastructure development plan, for instance, it would identify, create a list of any requirements that are, are essential to ensure the development of a plan in a sustainable way. On the Central Lancashire Land Use Study, um, members will have had a presentation last time. It was just to update you that that work is progressing and it is the intention that a final report, once ready, will be published alongside the preferred options document. I won't run through what that document does because you've, you've had this presented to you previously but it will be a key document in developing the policies regarding open space and again getting that concise approach for central lancashire and also understanding how our green belt is functioning um, and, and and what policies are needed around that going forward on local plan viability our consultants are working well on the evidence there and have had some detailed information provided from each of the districts on viability statements to help them understand the type of issues that are facing developments coming forward. 
And they're also um, now going to be preparing our infrastructure development plan for us. So that this will run alongside the plan and we'll, as I say, just, just identify all those needs that we will we, we need to um, sort of have a list of uh, against the preferred options document. And the final thing to note is just duty to cooperate. So we haven't had any specific meetings since we've last met, but we are working closely with a number of councils at the moment who are in the process of taking their plan to the next stage, those being Wire and Blackburn, and also um, the places for everyone at Greater Manchester 9, not the Greater Manchester 10. Um, so they've just written to us just to ask about uh, positions and we, we, we respond to them in, in a, in a, if there's no issues, just to let them know and sign up to statements of common ground there. But again, it's just to note that we'll continue to engage with these bodies and also identify those specifically that we want to engage with as we move towards preferred options. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you for that. So generally on track compared to where we were last meeting. Good. We should be. Any questions on that report? Comments? Councillor Morwood. Just a quick one. Um, Lancashire County Council are going to, you say, um, procure consultants by May, did you say? Yes, so I met with them at the beginning of February to set out the timeline that we're working to and, and to, to ensure that they could deliver that. At that time, they were saying that they were in the process of internally agreeing which model that they need to take forward. So there's two models that they can deliver and the costs differ between the models. So I think it's an internal discussion on how much they can afford to spend and how long it will take to deliver. So it may be a case of, depending on how quickly we need this work, which model they will they will go for town. But it's the, the consultants effectively are in place to do it. Oh, okay. They just need to agree the costs and to get them in place. So the consultants, I think, is Jacobs that the county use um, on transport planning. Yeah, nice. um, so it will be the, them who will be in, the pla in place to do this. And they're also aware that we then need an actual update to the Central Lancs Transport Master Plan to accompany the publication version next year. So this piece of work initially was just to do the modelling work and to understand any direct impacts as a result of the site options that we're putting forward. And then the actual Transport Master Plan itself will be updated to accompany the publication submission. Thank you. We may revisit that in due course. OK. Any other questions or comments from anybody? No? In that case, again, we're asked to note the contents of that report. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, the next item, then, is to exclude the public and press, if any are on, but we will go through the notions of doing it. Could somebody propose that, please? Thank you, Councillor Morwood. Second that, please, somebody. All those in favour?